I'd like to begin with a little introduction. Jed, I may come back to you to share a little bit of your comments as well uh, of, of one of the people involved in today's discussion. So today we're really honored to have YYZU, who's a professor at the University of California, San Diego, but also a uh, entrepreneur that has a story from at the University of Illinois and now a new company that she's going to talk about as well. So I'm Laura Frerichs. I'm the executive director of the Research Park at the University of Illinois and Enterprise Works Incubator. This is our Startup Cafe talk today, and this will feature an entrepreneur who has gone through the whole journey from start to finish. I'll tell you a little bit more about YY and why we're going to feature her today. And I think a very appropriate talk for today, making lemonade out of lemons, a, a subject that hopefully will resonate with many of you who are dealing with changing times and all of us are reinventing right now and trying to figure out new ways to do our business, new ways to carry out our operations. So a little bit more about our speaker and her journey as well. She is a computer scientist and she was a faculty member here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign studying and researching areas that included computer reliability, data center management, operating systems. She has her PhD from Princeton. She's an ACM fellow, an IEEE fellow, a Sloan fellow, and has numerous awards. And she was working here on campus and decided that she would launch a new company. And that company was called Pattern Insight. And it came out of one of the research groups here at the university. And one of the early employees was Jed Taylor, who I'll introduce in a second, just to say a couple words. And that company was at Enterprise Works at our incubator. And they were selling to many companies across uh, the globe, actually, their software. And eventually that company was acquired by VMware. And that occurred in 2012. Shortly thereafter, Jed joined the university and many know him as the head of the Technology Entrepreneur Center. But YY's entrepreneurial journey would not, would not end with that uh, exit successfully occurring. She still had the entrepreneurial spirit and she actually developed her third startup, which is called WOVA. And that had considerable customer traction and attracted 15,000 conferences and events around the world using the platform used by many and continuing to grow as a business this year when we reconnected with her. So before um, she tells you more about herself, Jed, do you wanna say a few words about your involvement with YY? And I know you always have great things to say about her. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> yes, ha happy to. I think uh, we, we had a great time uh, launching Pattern Insight and, and doing it. But I'll, I'll, a couple of things I'll say about YY is that uh, like I said, I was one of her first graduate students at the U of I, and we had a great uh, research group, and uh, did a phenomenal job of building a, a group of students that have kept in touch, and it was almost like a family. They're still can keep in touch with a lot of those students, and a lot of, they consider friends, and I consider YY a great friend. And YY is a serial entrepreneur. She had a, a startup before she came to Pattern, or launched Pattern Insight, and I think, uh, as I think of her, she's just a, uh, a phenomenal leader, a scientist, and it's, I think one of the things that I, that it's a lot of fun now that I see is Hoover is taken off, and uh, it, we run the Think Chicago program with the mayor's office, and we use Hoover at Think Chicago, and it has nothing to do with me and <laughs> saying that we should use Hoover. They actually chose Hoover. The National Science Foundation uses Hoover. And another thing is uh, I do genealogy work. I do family history work on the side. And I was looking at a, a, a genealogy conference the other day and they were using Hoover. It has taken off. And I think it's a, a testament to, to YY and her inventiveness. And I think it's just a, it's a lot of fun to see that. And I had no doubt that that would happen when she uh, launched Hoover. So uh, I could go on and on about it, but it's, it's fantastic to have her back. It was a great loss when YY went to uh, UCSD. So. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. we can get her back here one day. I haven't given up hope. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jad. Thank you, Laura. Actually, the speaker of, uh, you know, when we um, started Hoover, actually tried to recruit Jad Taylor, you know, to do the startup again. I actually told her him, come here, be our co-founder, right? 
And uh, I mean, he liked the, the current the job at U of I so much. He said it's so fun to help faculty launch companies. So he didn't want uh, like a, you know to become Hoover's co-founder. And so it's uh, even yesterday I was uh, talking. I wish you know we have a Jed Taylor in the company. <laughs> so it's just, just to reflect how you know how valuable you know to have someone like Jed to really really actually from the beginning of the company even to the through the growth stage because of the skill sets is really really complementary. So that's I think thank you guys so much for you you know giving me this opportunity. Um, I think oh, let me okay. So it's a really good to be back virtually. Um, I have talked with Laura and the Jed. I said uh, U of I, Illinois, it's more like my home. Um, you know, in US, I have so many you know, you know, sort of friends, even like close family friends, colleagues, mentors uh, at a U of I. Um, my kids are still actually occasionally I still take my kids back to uh, Urbana Champagne to visit their friends. Um, so it's really nice to be able to actually kind of back, uh, come back virtually. So actually at the end of March, I actually purchased a ticket, a scheduled a talk at the department, CS department, that also arranged a meeting with a, like a research park, uh, but I had to cancel this trip because of the pandemic. So just a little bit my background. Um, I like I um, actually I started, as I mentioned, I started my career, my academic career uh, at the U of I. Um, in 2002. Before that, um, like actually different from, uh, you know, many professors actually, I started a, like a startup, actually a first work on startup before becoming a professor. So right after Princeton, um, my PhD thesis was uh, like a started, a, you know, a, uh, as a company. So that time actually almost every single startup was a spin off from university. My first company was a spin off from Princeton. So the uh, company was based in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, we raised about two million, um, two million uh, fund, uh, like investment. Um, I think then it was later, uh, about two years acquired by a public company. It was not a very good exit. It's like the investor definitely get the money back, but majority of employee, including the founders, is uh, like we'll have a really, really nice stock option, uh, much better than if we would uh, join individually. So, but I learned a whole lot. I decided not to join that a big company. Um, you know, I, I like my advisor, my former advisor told me if I, you know, needed to, if I didn't go back to academia, it's going to be too late uh, because I was already like a PhD, you know, after two years after PhD. So I didn't join that uh, com big company. Um, so I actually interviewed uh, in academia. And I was lucky enough to basically join uh, you know, Illinois, UIUC. Uh, as in 2002. And I really, really liked the whole environment, the department. I had a really so many great mentors, like, you know, Sarita, Joseph, and uh, Roy, and Clara, many, many people there, um, my mentors. And I also have a lot of friends. Like, you know, people live very close in Champagne, like in those areas, Cherry Hill, those areas. So we go to each other, like our kids grow up together. We go to each other, for, like a house for dinner. So I also learned the cooking quite a bit. I actually now, like many of my San Diego friends were so impressed like, that I can cook. I said, because at Abana Champagne, we don't have that many restaurants choices, we cook. And we have a dinner parties, right? So, and I'm also really lucky. Um, after three and a half years or so, um, you know, I gave me tenure. So that actually really sort of, kind of, um, you know, give a really nice transition actually um, in 2007 when we launched uh, Pattern Insight. It was actually pushed by customer. So we published a paper in 2004. And then some uh, company like Cisco, they read our paper, they keep saying, hey, can we get your prototype? I said, no, our prototype is not usable. <laughs> and they said, hey, why didn't you build a product? I said, you know, I told them my PhD student not gonna build a product for you. They, they need to finish their thesis. So then they actually keep pushing. They even went into pay a bit of money ahead of time. So we, then we raised the investment. And then um, actually at that time, because all our customers at that time is in the Bay Area. So we, in 2008, we moved the company to the Bay Area, but it was still maintained in Illinois office. So by the way, actually in the beginning of 2007, the entire company is uh, at the research park. 
And uh, I still remember, like, it's really good facility. We don't need to worry about, like, okay, who's, how we're going to receive mail. The internet is there ready. I don't need to deal with the, all those companies. So different. Like, when I launched Hoover in San Diego, I was like, wow, I need to do all this tons of uh, those things. Even yesterday, I tried to negotiate with the, the like, for the, renew our like a lease for the office, right? So I think that the research park really provide all this nice facility for entrepreneurs not to worry about all those logistics. And then um, like in 2008, we moved to um, kind of a, a, a barrier. So I was a, like a commute back and forth between Champaign <laughs> and then Silicon Valley was uh, really, really tough. So I took a, a leave of absence for one year. So it was a back and forth. And that was really tough. So that time also my husband had to read, um, you know, he worked in the industry. There's not a too many job choices uh, at Urbana-Champaign. So then that time is basically UCSD came along, say, hey, commute from San Diego to Bay Area is close. And that there's so many companies for your husband here. So then uh, I feel, figure it's maybe better for family. So then I moved to San Diego. So, but I still actually, the padding set is still in Silicon Valley. So I was still commute, uh, kind of in a way. And uh, then later was uh, acquired by VMware. I was, it's actually really nice that none, I think the original team, founding team, none of them left the company. So we still remain as friends. Every time I go to Silicon Valley, we get together for lunch. Um, so it's really actually, it's really nice. Um, that's one thing. And each of them after they work for VMware for two years, they launch their own startup too. I think Jada knows really well. I think every time Jada goes to the Bay Area, probably you know, meet the spirits, my like all the co-founders um, of Pat Inside. And I'm actually, as an academic person, I'm really happy, like the product uh, called Lock Insight. Uh, VMware still keep, uh, even keep the name of the Lock Insight. So if you search Lock Insight, because of the, why the pro product is named Lock Insight, because the company is Pat Inside. So we have two product, one is a code inside, the second one is a lock inside. So VMware still um, kept the, keep the same name, lock inside, and it's now actually used in um, thousands of data center for like a data center monitoring, security forensics. Um, so it's actually, as academic, it feels really good because they're using the product and actually so many people are using the product. So that's the, the part. And then in 2013, um, but yeah, so then actually that time, actually we launched Hova, um, is a, um, you know, for conference and uh, this is a kind of event. Uh, so far has been used by 15,000 uh, conferences in actually kind of uh, in 93 countries. So why actually um, kind of doing Hova is, um, as a good academic, actually I didn't realize like networking is that important until, until actually we did a pattern inside, I realized Wow, people information is, uh, you know, really useful. I still remember, I think Jada was probably in the meeting. We did a product demo for one of the potential customer. And then that uh, our main contact person brought uh, two more people. One of them is a VP. So we had all this demo. And then the, the VP was still skeptical. He said, you know, you're a tiny startup. But are you sure your stuff can work, right? And... Um, so then I, we felt like, oh, somehow we cannot convince this VP that our solution is viable, can solve the problem. So after the meeting, I, I searched the name of this, this VP. I found out, wow, this, is, this VP is a U of I grad, right? It's a graduate from a U of I. So if I had I known that, I would just to say, hey, this, this our technology is out of your of our research. He would know, you know, how strong the engineering school is, right? He would, he would have no doubt about our technology. So that time I realized actually, especially for example, for sales, when you are, uh, or business development is so important to have a people information because of the background, if you know the background, you can build a trust. Right? You may find something common, you can help increase the, the trust because it, the human being is still very subjective, right? It's not just purely objective based on the technology, especially in one hour demo, it's really hard to convince them that, oh, okay, the technology is good, we can solve your problem, okay? So that actually, we start to get, you know, and then especially actually face-to-face -face meeting is really, you know, kind of good because uh, 
That's why actually before the pandemic, many conferences, the events are still face to face, right? Because it's a, you know, you know, in a way you build stronger connections if you have to talk with the people uh, face to face or even at this, it's actually better compared to like, oh, I connected with someone in LinkedIn virtually or I emailed this person, right? So that is actually that time with us, we are thinking, we want to do something to bring people information and to actually the real world use case. Not just uh, LinkedIn is great, right? LinkedIn be able to, you know, uh, be able to actually you can for recruiting and for everything is good. But I think that those information not handy at a meeting, at a business meeting, at a business events. So you guys basically, I talk about Hoover it's for events, but uh, do, do you guys, what's the first version of Hoover app? It's actually it's a people search app. So our technology, just like any academic professor start a company, um, is like a, our technology is called an entity resolution. So we aggregate information from the internet about the people. Um, but there's so much information. Even you search LinkedIn using my name, my name is a bit weird. But still, you search my name, they're, they're gonna be, you're going to find a 40 LinkedIn profile with my name. Only one of them is not me, right? You search Facebook, there are going to be even more match uh, results return. So there's a whole lot of information and all this name ambiguity creates a problem. So we have this, uh, we use actually complicated, like a complex probability statistic model. We even get, a, um, you know, all this kind of database from the, like actually the public record. So we know how popular is each name. So we use all this thing, build the entity resolution technology. So we'd be able to have a good accuracy, be able to say, oh, this LinkedIn profile and this homepage from your bio is more likely to be the same person, but the other one is probably not the same person, right? So that's all technology. And then no different from many professors, how professors start a company, which just say, hey, we're gonna take this technology just straight forward uh, to build an app application, right? That's a people search app. So then the, the basically, the, then the, that time the full funding team just to say, hey, we're gonna launch this people search app. And, um, and then uh, every day we have hundreds, I think of 300 to 500 of download. In the beginning, you're really happy, right? With that kind of download, or like a 300 of, uh, to 500 without no advertisement, that's great, right? So we thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And then we imagine gonna you know, take off. So we launched the company or license the technology from UCSD. We said, hey, we're ready to go. And they, because of you know, my former track record in Silicon Valley, so I have a few friends that are eager to say, hey, they're angel investors. They say, let them put a little bit of money. So I said, we don't really need the money, but you guys can put a little bit. So we get a, a, about a, a quarter million. Uh, from angel investor, not that much, but uh, still be able to, so we can be able to really, really separate the team away from UCSD so they can focus uh, just, uh, you know, to uh, like uh, on the company, right? I think that UCSD doesn't have a research part, so there's a really no place. So we have to, you know, find the office and uh, do all this other arrangement. So then, so that's actually kind of a way basically to separate the team out and uh, then uh, like launch the, the Hoover, right? And, um, okay, but uh, the hardest thing about a, um, a startup, it's not a, actually just about a good idea. So we feel like we have a good technology. We feel like people information is useful. So we feel like actually we can, you know, we found out, okay, that's great, right? And all the angel investor want to put in a, um, a quarter minute, which is not bad. So, um, but uh, as you know, it's our, our ideas are actually easy. <laughs> Implementations are really, really hard. Um, so, you know, success, the startup success is never a straight line. It's always a bloom, bloom. Actually, you don't know how many like up and downs, right? So many companies just, you know, disappear doing all those like a downtime, you know, but there were just many, okay? So, um, so the, our first tough time at Hoover is actually, uh, we measured there's very few returning users. They download the app, they use the app, and they don't come back afterwards, right? And the more important, we studied the behavior, we found the actual majority of users download the app around 10 p.m. of the local time. It's because I think when we're guessing popular people go to bar, 
So the met someone <laughs> at the bar, then they start a search. And uh, usually those are probably not easily, if, uh, if you Google it, unless you're like an academic or famous, you cannot like, easily find this person. So then they start to say, hey, I can download the app, and maybe the app is better than a Google because they specialize in people search. So then they download our uh, people search app, but uh, afterwards, they just, you know, either they found the person or they don't find the person, they don't come back, right? So that was really tough because I did, a one, uh, did a, like a two company before I know this, we don't have a business here. If we don't, we don't have a returning user, I don't see a business model. So I talk, I set it together with the founding team one-to-one. -one. I don't want to put it, set them to get all together. Instead, I just one-to-one -one have a meeting with them. Why? Because I, if I sit all with them together, they're going to feel, feel the peer pressure. If one person said that he wants to continue, um, he or she wants to continue, the other people are going to feel the peer pressure to say continue too. So I want to talk with the, just me and the one-to-one -one conversation with the, each of them. So this way, they don't have a peer pressure. I wanted them honest, uh, like opinion. So I told them, hey, what's you, what do you want to do? You want to quit or you want to um, continue? If you want to quit, I can help you, maybe introduce you to my contact at Google, Facebook. I mean, they all have like a PhD or a master from, um, you know, from good school. So they definitely can be able to get into those top companies. And um, so actually surprised, Actually, even though I did a one to one without a, you know, put them together, only found one founding team member decided to go. Every other member decided they want to give a one more year, right? They said that after one more year still doesn't work, um, they're going to quit. I found that this is really, really good because they already realized needs to find a way. There's only one year, only one year. So we need to find a way. So there's a, Somehow, suddenly, the whole team decides like more risk taking. They say, oh, let's try new ideas. We need to find a way to work out. Otherwise, there's a constant debate. Of, oh, this is not a good. That always has a lot of competitor. But when you only said we're going to have that one year limit, I think somehow people are much more open to try something, maybe have an obvious flaw, but they're still open to try. So then that's how we pivoted to events. I was inspired by my own needs. Uh, so that time there's a, uh, San Diego has a, this a startup event. Um, they invited me. So I was decided, should I go? Um, they already have the attendee list. So I was like trying to search one by one. Who are those people, right? I mean, it's worth what, because I need to drive all the way to downtown and the parking is terrible. So, uh, so I was like deciding, should I go? So I was like going the list one by one. Then I realized, okay. You know, if I, for me to like a search every single person, find out what are the background or what they do, um, once I get a finished five, I said, this is not doable. I'm not going to search all of them, right? So then I re come to my mind, when you just research one person, you can use Google. Even though Google, you have to go through pages of pages to find if this page, you know, matched with the person you're looking for. I mean, it, like a, we can speed up that a little bit our tool is still valuable, not a painkiller. But if you, like an event, have a, like a 500 people or like even more people, you're not going to uh, research as every single person, right? So in this case, our tool, if we actually, every person, we can build the profile so you can just browse or you can even do future who is an investor, who is a founder, who is from the, uh, Google, and who graduated from U of I, we actually return the list back to you, then our tool is actually a painkiller. So that actually came to my mind as well, okay? So we, maybe we should, you know, go for the kind of events. So that time I told the team, I said, don't write one line of code yet. Let me sign up for one customer first. Um, so, when, so actually that was a, just a UCSD, the CSE department had a 25 year anniversary. And that time the Trump decided to do a big event is a whole conference. So when you invite some famous researchers, to give a keynote or give a talk, we also invited 300 uh, alumni back to the campus. 
So then I pitched to the department that it was the year of 2013. So I said, hey, you know, that day, like when we are CS department, see, like if we do have a mobile app for our anniversary, it doesn't make sense, right? So everyone has a mobile app. We are CS department for our anniversary, we need to have a mobile app. So then the department uh, chair, you know, bought it, not like pay, I said, you don't need to pay for anything. I, I also, you do not need to assign people to work on it. I have a team separately going to uh, develop this app for you. So it's named as a CSE 25. So, so then actually the, the department is on board. So we are told like the team going to meet with the, the organizer to, base, uh, to get the requirement and then develop the app. So the team was really good. Within one month, um, they developed both the Android app and iOS app. In, I remember in the beginning, when we submitted the iOS app, I had an even episode because Apple rejected the, our app because app, you know, iOS need to review app. So the reject our app and the, the event is, uh, was only four days away. So like we have to calling up like, you know, this is a friend at Apple, you know, please expedite the, the review, the event is coming. If you, so you uh, prove it uh, like uh, later, it's useless, this event app afterwards. So then they actually, I think the uh, Apple is really nice. So, you know, they actually prove it within like a half day. So we'd be able to publish it, the app and for people to download. So that was actually kind of the beginning. Afterwards, there are more events actually um, kind of sign up. I think our third event was the big TEDx San Diego. Then we basically kind of gradually go from there. So actually at that time, I didn't know how big the events. I didn't do any market research. We need to find a way out. So we try anything kind of that kind of spirit. Um, but events actually surprisingly, when I, we look at it, it's actually um, US alone has about 18 million business events per year. Um, on average, probably one professional attend at least one event. You could be like an uh, alumni events, trade show conferences and networking events, at least one kind of event per year. And then that time we business also kind of um, started getting into it as the business of um, actually found out some, like a, 20 years ago when I was in graduate school, you know, we need to book, you know, you ask a travel agent to book a flight ticket. We took a taxi, you know, to the conference hotel. We use a paper brochure. We chatted with the random people when getting coffee or sitting together for lunch. And we feel bored, you know, kind of a little bit bored and lonely, right? But I think for the first two have been changed, um, you know, quite a bit, right? We booked ticket of ourselves online. Uh, we took an Uber Lyft uh, to, you know, kind of to a hotel, but still we use a paper brochure and still we rely on like, oh, we're standing in line waiting for coffee and the chat with the people and the randomly, you know, meet the random people, right? So, uh, and then we still feel lonely because, you know, especially as a you know, kind of student and newcomer at a conference, it's, it's lonely. You know, no one talk with you. It's really intimidating to talk with a stranger. So that time we really, really want to feel like, okay, there's opportunity if we um, see we can transform the events, okay? But once again, the success is not a straight line. Okay, it's not like, oh, we pivot the events and then just goes off like that. So we have another, you know, kind of a tough time. Um, fundraising is really hard. This is, there's no fun in fundraising at all, kind of at all, right? So even given actually my track record, um, you know, because I've done startup before, um, setting up, the, actually a lot of people open to meeting with me, okay? But uh, actually from the first meeting to a term sheet, just it takes a long time. And it took us a three months uh, to get a term sheet. And then from term sheet to money in the bank, took uh, actually four more months. So sometimes you get a term sheet, it doesn't mean, oh, wow, we should celebrate. There's so like a lot of DD, oh, please talk with this partner. How about that partner? We need to talk with you one more customer. So we end up like, I think the VC talk with like a 12 of our customers, right? Just like again, again, because they're not so sure. They don't want to, they want to reduce the risk kind of in a way. So it's again, again, I still remember we're in kind of one of November, 
I, you know, I flew to Vancouver because actually at that time that VC partner is in Silicon Valley. So I need to fly to Silicon Valley. Then like the day, the night before he said, oh, I need to go to Vancouver. Can you change a flight to come to Vancouver? I said, sure. So I, I, mean, I, I find out, I get my passport and then change the ticket to Vancouver, right? After I met with him, uh, him that VC partner at Vancouver, and he was so negative and blah, blah, all those things. So when on my way back, uh, also actually at uh, the Vancouver, because I booked like a random ho uh, hotel, it was too late. So I almost get robbed at that hotel. So I was, uh, at the airport was so emotional, I cried. Okay, so I felt like, it, you know, just that is the, the, the VC who gave us a term sheet. And it's like, it's, and still they have a doubt and still I'm trying to, you know, whatever best, you know, possible. They say San Jose, I fly to San Jose. Now you say Vancouver, I fly to Vancouver, right? And um, I was thinking at my age, I'm like doing, running like, a, you know, like that. It's really, really depressing. Um, and, but I had to, too, because we had only two months of salary in the bank. And... Uh, um, I was really appreciative actually this, uh, the funding team and the angel investor helped us during this time. So the funding team uh, all volunteered to cut their own salary. I couldn't cut my salary because even from day one until even now today, my salary has been always zero. So I don't take a salary from Cuba. Right? So I cannot cut my salary <laughs> in this case, but the funding team all volunteered to cut the salary. Um, we didn't actually cut the salary, but the fact that they volunteered make the economy done. I said, okay, if I, uh, we cannot close that one, uh, we can, we will just basically, you know, reduce people's salary. So I know I said, okay, we have a way to drag another six months. And also we have a few angel investors who just say, okay, they can put them in more money and then be able to give us one year runway and until the... Uh, so this really, really gave me a whole lot of confidence. So I started to talk with the, um, this, is the, the, this is the VC. I said, well, if you guys are not ready, um, we need to move on. So maybe we can just raise some money from invest, angel investor first. And after one year, we can talk with you. And that somehow did a push on the VC. Because they started to realize maybe after one, one year, we're gonna become more expensive, right? The value of the company will increase. So it was a really, really like a, exactly in Christmas day, um, the VC um, actually, you know, uh, this is actually close to the Series A with us. So it's really like Santa gave us the money <laughs> during Christmas day. It was really, really like, a, everyone is so happy. So they will end up not, don't need to cut the funding team salary. And the, oh, angels still, they put in the money. We didn't ditch the angels. The angels still put in the money in Series A. But I just say it's like, I do expect the fundraising to be hard. And, you know, it's not like uh, people have a track record that definitely have the easier. Um, especially for if you're a bit of minority, like me, like a woman, do expect what, you know, kind of maybe it's going to be a little bit extra harder. Just keep that in mind. But it should not be the reason to give up. Okay, so it did happen. Um, so that's actually kind of one uh, second toughest time. So after that, we've uh, continued to grow the company for a few couple years, few years. So then we have like about 15,000 events in 93 countries. The company grew to 95 employees since 2018. You know, we were break even. Um, all the employees are actually in the US. We learned from Pat Inside I think the that we used to have a team in Shanghai, but we found that the communication is really, really difficult. So this time at Hoover, we decided to, you know, majority of people actually, 60, like around 64 in San Diego, at that time we had a one employee in Urban and Champaign. Because I always want to have a branch office in, uh, in Urban and Champaign. So that time we already had one. Still, that we, right now we have two more employees in Urban and Champaign. So, but I think we wanted to be more, this way it's a uh, early startup uh, communications are really, really important. We want to be able to iterate really fast and pass the feedback to the product team, to the marketing team really, really quickly. Um, so we have many, many positive reviews and I will not repeat that. Um, so the revenue continue to grow every quarter and then you're going to see a dip, right? So there's a dip at the end. Uh, that means, uh, you know, that's the third the toughest of time, the pandemic. Because you, uh, when in March, April, 
all, almost all events are canceled or postponed. So uh, our marketing leads drop significantly to almost a single digit. And the sales also drop because no people just don't know what to do. They just first cancel the events or say they're gonna postpone, they're gonna see what's gonna happen. Uh, it's so much uncertainty. And also some customers start asking for refunds. And so it's really chaotic. And some several employees, uh, actually sales people, <laughs> Um, we have a couple of sales people um, immediately sense of that they figure, okay, this event's gonna for one year not gonna do well. So then they resign and switch to stable companies ahead of the time. And we're burning quite some money every week because there's no actually we don't receive money, right? We even have to pay uh, for some events. Some customers they really really push harder, so we even actually give them refund. So uh, we're burning quite some money every week. And uh, it's not just us. Competitors are ordering off people. Eventbrite is a, a couple of company doing event registration. They laid off a 45% of employee during the pandemic. Cvent is another actually, they used to be public, but then was privatized uh, you know, by a PE firm for like $2 billion. They also laid off 15% of the people. So in this case, like, you know, we had uh, this tough decision to make. Should we you know, um, lay off of people too, should we change? Uh, I know it's actually recruiting people, good people, it's really, really hard. Um, so uh, I just feel like, you know, uh, we, I really, really want to delay laying off of people because, uh, you know, uh, you may be short term, you are fine, but long term, you have to like rebuild again, recruiting people, it's really, really hard. So we decided, okay, let's change. Let's adapt to virtual events. So, so we immediately move all engineers. We used to have engineers build internal tools, build tools for sales, build tools for marketing. We immediately move all engineers uh, to build a, to support a virtual event, to build all those features for virtual event. I think probably before the pandemic, if you use a Hoover before, you know we only have a mobile apps. So we have like another so good web app for people don't like a smartphones, don't have a smartphone, or people at that time use like Blackberry or Microsoft phones. So we said, we're not gonna build an app for Blackberry, we just have a simple web app. But it was really, doesn't have many features, mostly it has the only agenda. So we need, um, we need it quickly because for a virtual event, people wanna use a browser, you'll be able to watch the session there. So we actually kind of, uh, Put a, we're quick and move with engineers to um, for, like you know build out the web app, add, a, add a more and more features, many features into the web app. But instead of actually do a major product release, we actually do a lot of like a quick, quick to find the MVP, minimal viable product for virtual event, and uh, on top of our existing like mobile app. So we actually within like two weeks, we said we have a virtual event support. That time, if you join um, Zoom, use Zoom for streaming we have to redirect it to Zoom. So then later we build out more, like we be able to actually embed a Zoom there, we embed a Vimo there into our platform. So you don't need to leave the web app, our whole web app or mobile app. We also add a lot of kind of uh, virtual event support for like exhibitors or sponsors, like they can do streaming, they can upload a video and all those things. Recently we released career fair as well. So employers can uh, upload the video, set up a streaming and the, uh, uh, like attendee can submit the resume for jobs, apply for jobs that they're interested. So we, you know, just do a lot of a quick iterations to basically to make it a, you know, better and better for virtual event support. Another thing is besides product, we said we need to quickly launch a webinar um, because uh, the customer don't know what to do, right? So they are looking for solution. They need to be educated. And we, even though we don't know much either, that we can like launch, we can learn first, right? Being a bunch of PhDs, yeah, we can learn. So we click learn what kind of platform play around. And then we launch a, a webinar, you know, kind of a, to educate customer, right? Um, actually, we never done webinar before, but we had a figure, you know, we learn along the way. And that time we had no special marketing person. So I actually put the webinar slides together and we had our internal designer to make it a really look professional. And then we have our supported people to do the audio recording and host the webinars and answer Q and A during the webinar. 
So it was pretty successful. So every week we had about 500 to 1,000 people sign up to our webinar. We have two webinars per week, even actually this morning at eight o'clock our time, like two hours ago, um, you know, we had a webinar uh, kind of there. So, and we, um, we have generated actually about a, more than 10,000 marketing leads that way. Right, and we constantly improve the webinar. We every webinar we run a survey, and they come back, and then we based on what they feel, uh, you know, feedback. We improve the content, and again, again, again. So that's actually one thing. Is really want to say is that don't feel, you know, you have to wait to hire that marketing person or wait to hire that a salesperson. Uh, you can do something yourself. Maybe not as good as the true marketing person, but uh, instead of wait, just do it uh, you, yourself first. Okay, so I think that's a, uh, I think later in July, we hired a, a, a kind of a, a part-time content marketing person. So now she can write, a, you know, blogs and those things. And she also later become a full-time like this month. So just the basis, uh, as I said, is like, don't wait until you hire that special uh, professional. Um, so the bounce back was really actually surprising to us. So in July and August, um, our sales beat the pre-pandemic revenue record by 1.5x. So every month we had a new record. And not only the overall sales record, we have also the like a many, many individual record. Uh, even our sales rep was surprised uh, that uh, they can close that many deals. So like last month, our sales, one the best sales, he did like five times more than the five times more than the pre-pandemic time. And actually, uh, during this, um, uh, this period, we have helped uh, um, 1,500 plus events move to virtual. Even this month alone, um, actually, there are about 500 virtual events using Hoover. And we're recruiting you every single department, um, sales, marketing, support, engineer. We also post a job you know, for Urbana Champagne as well. Um, we want to recruit more people here because uh, I think when, after the pandemic, we do have a plan to have a physical office uh, in this is uh, in Champagne or Urbana. So that's actually really the kind of thing. I just want to share some kind of a, a recent review um, because as academic, it's not just about, a, you know, kind of a grow the business. I want to feel like we're helping people, right? Well, this is actually really recent review. Um, so the Cherokee na nation, Native American, that nation, they have 100,000 people. So they sign up using Hoover to celebrate the, their the new year virtually. And uh, um, someone wrote a review in Google Play was really touching because of this pandemic hit them really big, um, you know, kind of uh, in a way, and they felt so good to their family and, and uh, they together can celebrate this new year um, virtually using Google. That's really, really touching. And then another, on the right side is some speaker, um, yeah, this is a this is a US put posted this thing on LinkedIn said that they actually not only um, she, as a speech she not only can network and she can also organize a forum a discussion and also share documents. So we found actually during this tough time we help connect the people together, um, kind of virtually and the people uh, and also business you know professionally. So that's actually kind of uh, really really touching. Um, so what do we learned here? Um, when there's a tough time, sometimes lies a great opportunity. Like if we don't have a, like we keep doing the people search, we we'll never feel like we need to pivot to anything, right? So like we pivot to the event because it, doesn't, it didn't work. And then also recently we pivoted to virtual event to support a virtual event is because of the, you know, it was really bad. Everything is like dropping. So that means it's really, when there's a tough time, the lies of great opportunity, opportunity to lead, and the opportunity to help. Um, so that's actually my part of the talk. And quickly, I think uh, my co-founder, because uh, Wei Wei actually graduated from a U of I, a PhD was my, from my group uh, at a U of I. So she, uh, he is actually U of I uh, alumni. Uh, he's a, a co-founder at Hoover. And what's interesting about him is actually in Hoover, even though he has a computer science PhD, he's leading our sales team. So he has about uh, he has about 35 people in his team now, all sales. So I figure, you know, he may have something interesting to share as a computer science peer doctor. How are you going to lead a sales team? 
Wait, wait. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, you just say next slide. I'll control it for you. Okay, thank you so much, Waiwei. And uh, really, thank you for the opportunity to be back in Illinois, in like virtually. So I'm, I'm really excited, actually. So I think I'm the last PhD student graduated from, uh, from UIUC, from YY's group. Uh, I, I got my PhD from computer science. And then like, you know, I, I mean, of course, when, when we were like at the very beginning, so YY already talked a lot about like the Hoover story. And uh, I mean, of course, before like probably joined Hoover, I want to mention a little bit like why, I guess there's some, I don't know about the like participants in this event, right? A lot of people probably either already doing startup or thinking about doing startup. I would say like, you know, why I'm joining like in Hoover, I mean, of course, first of all, inspired by, by YY, you know, so uh, even from this talk, I, I know all the things like, you know, uh, what happened, what are the journey, like all these tough times, right? But uh, still, I'm, every time uh, I listen to what YY said, I, I learned something, something new from the talk. And then, and the same thing, like, I think I learned the, so I was also invited for by some people like Jeff Taylor, right? So why we talked about like, you know, and Jed is uh, uh, the first student from YWAS group. Um, so to be honest with you, uh, uh, I, at least I personally, and I know like many, many other people like me were inspired by all those stories. And by also like, you know, in Illinois, those entrepreneurs, right? So research park. Uh, I've been, I've been in Illinois for, for two years or three years and then, uh, from, from the beginning, I joined uh, like University of Illinois. Those those stories always inspired me about all this entrepreneurship, and where they get started and how they uh, went through tough times. So, and so that's how I get started. You know, from engineering, I joined Hoover, and and then of course, like you know, you guys heard uh, like a wild story. So, I think one thing is like you know, I sh I gradually shifted to sales uh, because. Uh, like man, like many people, I like in, especially from some like someone like with engineering background. I thought like okay, there's a good idea, and then oh, okay, I know how to do coding and implement it, and then everything can be done, and then it's gonna take off, right? I mean, uh, every one of you know the answer, right? So pretty much, it's not gonna take off, okay, with uh, with the idea, uh, with like implementation. So uh, there are a lot of things behind it, like you know. Uh, like why we talk about fundraising, we also talk about gaining uh, like, you know, uh, like, you know, customers, right? So, and then also businesses, how business runs behind it, whether there's revenue model, like, you know, business model behind it. That's why, why we talk about shifting to people uh, from people search to events. And so, and I, I just want to share a little bit like, you know, behind the story in sales. So, yeah, why we next slide. So uh, I still remember, like, you know, so, so uh, like, you know, that time, so, uh, like, you know, what I would talk about, before we start, like, do any coding, write a single line of code, uh, why would I talk to us, like, you know, we need to get a customer first, okay? We want to find out whether there's really, like, you know, uh, people need our product. So that's, that's when I think uh, YY, uh, starting from YY, okay, do the hard things that like, you know, one by one, like uh, that don't scale, right? So one thing is about uh, getting the first customer. How can you get the first customer? So uh, I remember like, you know, so this is pretty much like, uh, you know, when in Illinois, uh, I remember 2006, 2007, there was really, really big snow and then you have to dig your car out of, uh, out of the snow, right? So. And that's, that's pretty much the, the, the kind of spirit that you need to do. Um, uh, like you need to do things that don't scale, like getting the first customer and then recruit the first sales people, right? So uh, I remember how I and how we recruited the first sales people. And then um, pretty much like, we, I don't know about sales. I mean, I'm, I'm from engineering. I mean, of course, why I know about sales, like in enterprise sales and then but what are we gonna do, right? So uh, I remember I, and then together with some people, our like founding team, we go to a local university. Uh, we go to every floor by floor, like, you know, post those job posts. 
uh, like, you know, recruiting people, hey, we are hiring, we're a startup, and then write some, like, you know, fancy word about startup, right? So trying to recruit people. Every floor, right? So we also know some secret place may got a good people, like, you know, because we're trying to use a different email. Like you guys know, like you, you can plus one or plus two, try to use a different email to track where those are, uh, uh, like, you know, candidates are coming from, right? So, you know, sometimes the restaurant will, will be a good place. So, and then also like, you know, the, those libraries and then like a student unions, those are good places, right? So I think one thing I really learned from this is uh, if at the very beginning, I'm th still thinking about, oh, like in startup it's really fun and then you got to do a lot of fancy things uh it's not about that right so you need to be prepared to really really do the hard things that don't scale um and then we got the at the very beginning we got those uh those candidates from local universities by posting those job posts uh floor by floor and then deep go to different places Right, so and then we recruited interns from those uh, schools, and then that's how we started uh, building our sales team. Yeah, so I think that's pretty much uh, about that. And but then gradually we're scaling, right? So we recruited our first intern. Uh, and one thing very interesting, if there's something like uh, I think this is also learned from YY, right? So. Why we're also talking about if you if you recruit, don't recruit one person, recruit two. Right, you're always trying to recruit two at the same time, so uh, they can learn from each other. So really, so if you recruit one people, you don't know, it's really, really hard to get uh, people started. That you need to recruit two, so number one, they can learn from each other. And number two, sales is not easy, right? So uh, like sometimes you have, uh, you had a bad day, uh, you had like a bad week, and then some, sometimes you have a good week, right? So you have to some people to talk to each other and to learn how, how to go, like, you know, go through those tough times. And then of course, in the meantime, these two people can like compete each other, with each other. So um, that's one, one thing. And the second thing is like you, uh, from, from this experiment, right? By recruiting different candidates, uh, you start to define what are the good qualities or like good characteristic of a successful salesperson. So, and this is one thing we learned from the book as well. So at that time also why we organized us to read books because I, I really know nothing about sales, right? So, uh, um, so, and then how, what kind of person to recruit, right? And also what is a sales process? How can you close a deal? And how can you reach out to those uh, potential customers? Um, so one thing very important is you, you're going to adapt and, and learn. So that pretty much defines how you can gradually uh, shift your mind and then gradually learn how to, how to do sales. So we're starting from like learning uh, uh, how to recruit the pre people, right? So and, uh, there's a, uh, like a very famous book. It's about a formula of sales, right? Acceleration. So uh, that's from HubSpot, which is from a tool that like, we're using right now, the whole sales team. Um, so first of all, define the characteristics of success sales for people. And then of course, once you define them, so you need to tune them, right? So oh, this is, a, we thought that this is the right person to recruit um, at the very beginning, but then gradually at a different stage, you probably need to tune and then recruit different, different people. So um, at the very beginning of start, like when you start the sales, you need to recruit someone who have yeah, we'll be able to explore the sales processes, right? We'll be figure out the formula to, you know, close a sale. But then gradually, so you, you recorded those sales processes, then you start to learn, okay, uh, uh, write it down, and then we need to scale now. So what would be the people that can be organized and then like follow the process well, and then be very, very like, you know, uh, hardworking to like, you know, uh, close the modules. So we, we record all those sales processes and gradually like you know, tune those sales processes then. And of course that served the playbook of like sales recruiting. And then from there, we find the different channels to get the right candidates, right? From like, you know, local universities or even like you know, from UIUC, right, in Illinois. So we have two sales, like where we said, we have two sales person right now from, uh, from Illinois. And then, and one thing I really want to talk about, like, you know, so if you want to get into sales, don't think about like, okay, you have to sell, have to sales experience. We found out like, it's not necessarily the case. 
So a lot of the time, so if you like, you know, work in a restaurant or something, sometimes you have like a customer an interaction experience, or even you don't have any experience in sales, you could be very, very successful in sales as well. So if you like, you know, being really competitive, you've been really like, you know, organized and have a good time management skills, and you always strive to be better, like you have your goal to achieve, it doesn't matter whether you have sales experience or, or not. Like, you know, if you are interested, in startup, uh, in like growing yourself, feel free to send us a resume, right? So, because we are hiring, <laughs> we are hiring, like what I said, in all departments, sales, engineering, marketing, and support. Next so, slide. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wei Wei, you may interrupt, but Laura messaged me, say, you know, probably we need to leave a few minutes for questions. Of course, yeah. yeah. So I'm pretty much done with next slides, Wei Wei. Okay. So, and then we recruit all these web people. So we provide a really, really good training after we find out, okay, those are recruiting playbook. And then we also uh, uh, form our training playbook, right? So, um, so uh, it's really, so we provide, we believe in the coaching and also sales clinics like every week that what you could learn. And then of course, take those feedback from your sales managers from the training into the, into the practice. That's what we, we uh, like, you know, we found like being coachable is one of the most important, uh, like, you know, characteristic for a successful salesperson. And plus sales can be fun. Like why I said, one of our successful, like top sales, it's delivered more than five times, like the, the, the booking than before the pandemic. So we promote people really quickly in sales as well. It's really performance driven. So next slide, Wei mm -hmm. And another thing, so I, I talked about, I came from engineering background, so, one of the key things I think of being successful in sales and Hoover uh, uh, doing sales is we combine engineering and sales together. So we use like engineering tools, we build our internal tools to make the sales more efficient, right? To make like the sales, uh, uh, like sales people more easily to can close deals and then like incre increase our like a close rate or conversion rates. So that's pretty much the final thing I want to talk about a little bit like, you know, so when you think about getting from engineering to sales, there's a lot of benefit as well. So mm -hmm. I think that's pretty much all about that, yeah. Yeah, just a final thing. Well, I will leave the slides here. We're recruiting in both the places and uh, every uh, people recruited have a choice to stay in Champaign or move to San Diego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Go ahead, it's Laura, go ahead. <laughs> well, we hope people stay in Champaign, although San Diego <laughs> is lovely. Uh, Thanks for the great talk. It was great to hear your experience. And wow, what an amazing story this summer, being able to pivot from being um, sales crashing during the pandemic to a reinvent with virtual events. I think it's really inspiring of how to be savvy and nimble as a business to get through tough times and even come out stronger. I wanted to see if anybody else had questions. I didn't see any in the chat, but I know we've got some entrepreneurs on the phone. And if you had a question for, uh, Uva, that would be great. Or about YY's story. Don't be shy. I see one in the chat. Yeah. Uh, YZ says, for a faculty member launching startups with students, what is the fair practice to divide the equity among co-founders? I know there might not be a good answer. I've heard a crazily wide range. Do you have any suggestions? Well, my thought is that that could be a talk in and of itself. And I know we've had some on that topic. So go ahead. Um, so this is a definitely really depends. Um, I think it depends on like a whole, what a role you are playing uh, kind of in the way. So for example, um, if like a uh, if a, uh, you as the faculty need um, you know kind of you know do almost all a bootstrapping in every single possible way, like for example getting office, uh, raising funding, and uh, having the idea and the manager build the product, then you probably can have more shares uh, than you you know the rest of the fund co-founders. But if uh, um, you uh, Business that you you have you actually collaborate with your co-founder need to, you divide the work someone raise funding and uh, you manage the product or the technology then probably sometimes it's equal or sometimes I think the one runs the business side usually has more equity because uh, I that's the typical range I'm not okay which one is right I'm just saying based on what I heard that's the typical kind of range. Uh, because they need a, you know, uh, in the beginning of the, the, the startup actually 
uh, business actually need a whole lot of bootstrapping from zero, right? So, but I think it's really up to a, a people's contribution. So for our case, because uh, um, we, I did it with uh, my po former postdoc and PhD students. So actually I think a, well, after close the series A, the investor have never met my co-founders. They have never met my co-founders. And uh, so in this case, it's uh, kind of a bit of difference. So I, uh, my equity is more than my co-founders. But then as the time goes, actually, for example, um, a few, uh, like a, my equity was already fully vested already. About, uh, so are my co-founders a few years ago, like two years ago. So I pitched to the investor to give my co-founders more, more equity, but not the me. Because in order to you know, be able to actually get a more stock options to my co-founders, I uh, make sure I don't ask for more. So this way it's like, a, you know, they, uh, the co-founders, they can continue to have a more incentive uh, to build out of the company. So I think this is a, also sometimes investors have a, like a kind of a, they right now, they give me like the standard, okay, with directors, what level, but uh, you should always ask for employee two level above um, in order to recruit people. But investors usually have the Silicon Valley typical equity stock option range for different role. You make sure just ask the investor, you know, for those guidance, um, kind of in a way. Yeah. Sorry, I probably do not give you a really good uh, good answer. <laughs> okay. So the next question, what's the? Another question in the chat is also sort of related to investment. Um, and this is from Helen Zhang, who's an entrepreneur at Enterprise Works. Why, why would you obtain more VC funding to grow the business bigger? Very inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. So this is a really good question. So given our stage, um, what we need is not just money, um, kind of in a way. We, if money doesn't solve a major problem, we need the money bring the connection. Uh, for the kind of in, in a way. So that's actually different stages are different. Just remember when you bring more investors, uh, you also bring distraction as well. So be aware of that. So that's why uh, I think the, you know, uh, when um, at the, our stage, we're more really, really need um, money with the connections uh, to the right company for future potential partnership and exit, not just the money for you from the money's sake because our revenue is to the point can really su support our growth uh, in, uh, kind of in this case. Yeah. So the next question. Uh, so Sanjay, did you want to ask your question? I'm oh, not hi, sure Sanjay. if I understand it. I saw you actually like in the beginning. Yeah, hi, Sanjay. I, hi, how are you? I, 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 hi, I was hoping you will give me a chance to speak because I haven't seen why why in, in a while. She's on my fourth floor, <laughs> I fourth know. floor faculty, not just computer <laughs> science faculty. So, so it's great to see you. Great to see uh, uh, after all these years and all the progress. I didn't know about all the uh, intermediate companies I had and kept up with it. Uh, the question I had was, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in enterprise works. I uh, graduated out of enterprise works. We have a company which is mainly doing very uh, deep technical stuff. So it doesn't have a volume market. Uh, so we are still in that startup stage as it were. But my question for you is, as a faculty member, I noticed that you still have publications and stuff going. And even without that, just to run a big company like this, you have to figure out how to do delegation right uh, and how to do time management right and especially as a faculty member do you have some ideas and tips for that where what kinds of as an as a as a founder you feel like you want to do everything and you and and you say well i'll just double the amount of work i do every day but eventually you realize that doesn't actually happen and the quality of the work will suffer one way or the other so how do you deal with that um, I think you used to run really big a group, right? I remember when I was there, your group is of 25 people. So yep, you already like a big, like run such a big enterprise already. Now it is more like <laughs> 10, but eight, <laughs> eight maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So for me, I always have a co you know, co-founder. So that's why you should make my former students a postdoc as a co-founder, make sure they have a um, reasonable a bit of a kind of a share. They have, have a funding mm -hmm. share, not a stock option. And uh, uh, I found it's a really beneficial is like uh, the team, actually in the beginning, we just like running as this research group, but, like on the weekend, we watch videos. So like, uh, that's why we said that we, I still like in the mode of teaching people. Okay, even recently, 
even though have been like my co-founders have been doing this for five, six years already, we still had the episode because of SaaS draw. If you do SaaS company, uh, there's an event called a SaaS draw, S A S S T R. So they actually they have still running virtual event. So we actually have the video. There's so much YouTube video like a YC Y company there. All this actually about the business, how to build a, like a, how to build a product. Like all this the, the video available in YouTube. So actually, you see a VC, uh, a YC compilator. They have so many video actually online. So I just have the funding team watch video, like you know, probably kind of a, in the beginning, three, the first three years, we watch video almost uh, once every month. Um, like a, so, uh, they also need to read the books. I give them assignment. <laughs> also, by the way, actually, our company has a library, have a many many starter book that they can borrow and the return. So we have a system to do that. Um, then this way, actually, I found it's really, really beneficial. It's like I force myself, I told them, Tuesday, Thursday, don't bother me. I'll be at the university, leave me alone, okay? Um, the, uh, this way, so they have to be on their own. They cannot call me all the time to figure out, okay, what should they do in this case? What should they do in that case? Uh, I find it's really, really good in that way. I, they, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's not that I go to the company, it's just that they can call me if they have questions. But Tuesday, Thursday is my, my day, my university day, don't bug me. And uh, it's really good for them because they have to find a solution, they discuss with each other and they learned along the way. And they, I find it's also uh, actually reduces the stress on them because I'm not on them all the time. You had to probably know I'm like, I can be really, really pushy. And uh, so give them like two free days for them to figure out the things, decide the things. I find that that to be actually kind of re, uh, really, really good. So I, um, then they actually gradually be able to actually kind of step up and uh, have a, a one co-founder manager, the entire engineering team and the supporting team. And he was my former postdoc. And he's also really actually amazing. Even from technical background, he can negotiate with Amazon for like the cloud thing. He's actually this morning he negotiated with a stream platform called Agora. Say, okay, we need to lower the price because we're going to use our our infrastructure. So I think it, like they learn this way because I'm I told them I'm not going to be in that meeting. You better be meeting. You better cut it like I get a twenty percent discount, right? So I found that then they become really really capable. And then this is uh, actually, I always say what I intend to see the results. And then I can see if they can do it or not. Not all the co-founders, uh, founding team can do it, to be honest. I like Weibo is you know, great, I have another co-founder is great, but I also have some funding team, they just, um, you know, they cannot deliver that. So in this case, you can make appropriate arrangement or maybe you add an, an, some people to help them, recruit them, some people to help them. But I think my, I found it's like giving them a chance to try first and some would deliver, some, you know, can't. I still remember actually like when Jed, I was like so happy when Jed joined us. Okay, I handled him a bunch of things and then I, I don't need to deal with. I still, I, every time I told a way with story how you close the Cisco deal, was it really impressive. And uh, so I think that's, um, that's actually the, the, the part is, um, I guess probably, I don't know, like a stranger, maybe probably I'm a woman. Somehow they, they feel like if a woman can do, I'm not biased against women, just somehow the fact that I'm doing it, make them feel like, okay, they can do it too. So they feel like they want to help, him, uh, help me out. And then that really kind of helps. So we really um, kind of, uh, the, even at your pattern inside, Jed probably will remember, like uh, the, the founding team, uh, work really nice to well with each other until the right end, right? Jed, you want to basis you based on your observation at the at the PI, um, you want to you know have something to add? No, I just uh, agree with what you were saying. I think it's important to have a team that works well together and and that you can delegate to. And, and I I think uh, I think that's really important. And people that you can trust with and trust and and yeah, I just agree with what you've said. Yep. Whether you want something to like it, uh, probably you actually can comment them more because about uh, whether I dedicated, maybe I didn't delegate. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so probably uh, nice to see you, Prof Professor Kyle. So uh, yeah. I remember uh, like the, the first year I was in uh, UIUC, I was like a TA for Professor Kyle. I learned a lot from how to like, you know, uh, doing those teachings and then like giving, giving like those tests or everything like that. 
So uh, I can pretty agree with YY. So I think uh, uh, I also mentioned a little bit, uh, I'm of course, we're limited time, but uh, actually there are a whole lot I learned from during, uh, I mean, uh, this, uh, this uh, entrepreneurship, this like a journey and also shifting to sales, right? So I think uh, the, the thing is, uh, I, I truly appreciate like, you know, why I keep, uh, keep a lot of trust, uh, especially I have zero, literally zero sales experience, right? So, and then, but uh, every, every time like single things, I think, uh, 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 what what, uh, what what I learned is like it's a uh, it's okay to make mistakes, but uh, but don't uh, don't try to like fail at the same place twice. I think that's very very important, right? So uh, if uh, it, it, so, like you know, so like similar to when I was a PhD student in YWAS group, uh, YWAS was really nice when you were first year or second year, right? So, uh, but uh, when you become senior, then uh, you should learn. Uh, you should uh, like you know grow. Uh, I think that's uh, that's a lot of things by like reading books, uh, like you know we have uh, these uh, those video sessions uh, every Friday, right? So, and then like you know also, and then gradually I form a habit to find uh, to explore things myself and try to read books and then also like learn from others. So, I think those are very very useful. It, it's it's about the 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 process to to do things. I think that's very important. It's uh, I believe pretty much like going back to the recruiting, right? So really we require no experience in, in sales, but we, we do like require, you expect you to learn and then and, and grow, have an open mind to grow yourself. So uh, I truly believe like given that you are UC's background, you are all be able, I, I, there are a lot of great uh, students uh, as, I, as I know, like, you know, when I was back in UC, so I think that's very, very important. Yeah, I don't know if I uh, like add yeah. a little bit more to this or not, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I know like as a professor, usually we're more of a perfection list, but uh, one thing I learned along the way is like, um, I found like uh, if they don't make a mistake, they will not learn. So every time I like a hold of myself, even yesterday, like uh, one of my co-founders heard of me, I was like whispering to myself before I take the phone call. I said, don't get angry, don't get angry. <laughs> <laughs> so, right? So I like to try to, because they did something, like something, I was like tell myself ahead of time, don't get angry, don't get angry. <laughs> so uh, this is, uh, they, they really need to make the mistake to learn, uh, learn truly. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for the great questions, everyone. That's all the questions that I see that we have in the chat right now. Uh, yeah. And I have my, a remote learner who's sitting next to me right now, who you might hear. But um, anyway, thank you so much, YY um, and team. It, this was a great event. Again, we will have the recording posted. Um, so if you want to recommend that others watch this, it will be on our YouTube channel.